Just had a little porangi playing in my head. The man, the myth, the legend. Uh, one of my favorite humans on the planet who is not on this podcast, but I'm going to see as I get ready for travel to Sedona. And music is on my mind because I had a music master, Ian Morris, on this podcast who has a pretty fucking incredible story um, from the bottom of the bottom uh, and climbed his way out of that hole and has done very, very cool shit with, with his talents, with his skill and his unique gift to the world. He has been a longtime musician, uh, struggled for many years, and he'll dive into all this on the podcast, but what he's, term- what he's doing now is creating really therapeutic music. And uh, we'll link to all this stuff in the show notes, but listening to smile.com is an amazing place where you can check out exactly what he's doing. We, we dive into you know all this and more on the podcast. Um, everything that goes into it, it's pretty unique in that he is combining frequency with almost every genre of music. So he even has like death metal tracks, which I'm not into anymore. <laughs> I mean, if I'm lifting weights, maybe. Um, that are designed to pump you up, but with the frequency itself, it's going to cause more energy. And then meditation tracks of all shapes and sizes, um, hip hop tracks, you name it. He's doing really cool stuff. And uh, I got to learn a lot. He was on a guest on Paul Check's podcast back in the day and a good buddy of Jason Picard, who's been a guest on the show. Jason reached out to me. He's like, hey, man, Ian's coming to town. Uh, the two of those guys, along with Dr. Nathan Riley, all three of which have been on my podcast, are going on a hunt that I'm going to miss this week while I'm in Sedona. So better planning next year. But um, they're doing a sacred hunt with Monsel, and I'm going to run that back next year for sure. And just wishing all the, all you boys the best of luck on this hunting trip. Ian, I really appreciated having you on the podcast. This is the first of many. Uh, one thing I'd like to do in the future is include um, some of this music on the on the the old podcast itself, so people can drop in and tune in. Um, just click that link in the show notes. You're going to want headphones for sure, and they have a number of different um, tracks that you can use to unwind, that you can use for movement meditation. I mean, pretty much anything you can think of, these guys have thought of. And uh, it works like nothing else. They have one for pain that is absolutely incredible. Me, Jason, and Paul Check all absolutely love it. Um, so this is fantastic. It is next level. It is, in my opinion, the future of music. And we talk about that too. We talk about AI-generated music and what that's going to equate to. And um, the music industry itself, which is some, a lot there that I didn't really know about. Um, but it's, it's just fascinating. And uh, Ian was a great guest. This will be the first of more. Um, if you decide you like something on listening to smile.com, uh, punch in KKP at checkout and they will hook you up with a discount. I'm not sure what it is, but KKP is what we decided on during the podcast. He wants to make sure you guys get a discount on any products for my listeners listening to this podcast right now. And without further ado, my brother, Ian Morris. Well, I'll, I'll just hit record because we're having great conversation. There's no reason to leave this off. We're talking about our homie, Paul Check, And uh, this will release after it's over, I believe. But we we're just talking about the, uh, the tarot workshop that he is coming up in early November. And I think it's still going to be a- a- available online for people. So make sure you check that out, the Czech Institute. I'll link to it in the show notes. But the power of the tarot is is kind of mind-blowing you know it's kind of mind-blowing and you're like this is like harry potter's divination except it's it's more accurate than harry potter's teacher was you know <laughs> paul is is dead on with that and uh it's helped me tremendously it helped me tremendously when i went through my dark night of the soul it added perspective and a, and a, and a bright future that i needed to see in that moment whether that pans out or not you know yeah. like i needed that in that moment and uh many other times where it's just been so dead on in a very odd way. And that's not to, you know, loosely blanketly say that anyone who pulls a tarot card has it down. But when you're a direct and clean channel the way that Paul is, what he, what's coming through him, even in his analysis, as I'm breaking that down, is it's spot on. And it always has been. Yeah. Paul, I mean, it's not just the cards. It's like I've seen him do it with pictures of people. He'll look at a picture and just tell you, you know, right from the beginning, who this person is, where they're at, where there's a weakness or a strength, just from a picture. But like when I see him lay out the cards and he did a reading for me for a whole year and it was so powerful every single month, sometimes three, four events deep in the month, 
dead on every single time. It was wow. just so powerful. Yeah, it's it, he's definitely tapped in. Yeah, that yeah. sounds super cool. <laughs> you do art as well, correct? Because thinking about that, the the mandala workshop I did at Paul's. It was like the picture reading. He would look at our paintings. You know, we'd paint for the first day. Second day, all of us would have to do the walk of fire and go stand up there next to the painting. <laughs> yeah. And he'd be like, uh, how deep do you want me to go? You know, <laughs> like most people were like, fucking let it out. And and it was very exposing, you know, yes. like for me, I knew, you know, like, hey, I'm I'm here. <laughs> I'm, I'm here. I've got a lot to show and I'm, and I'm totally cool with it. But for a lot of people, it was very exposing. You could feel the discomfort, uh, but done in a very beautiful way. You know, right. it was illuminating and... and um, for the good, for the good of the group and for the good of the person he was he was breaking down. Yeah, Paul's definitely a no BS. He's going to chink the armor and get down to that vulnerability that is where the healing takes place, you know, the facing those shadows and that darkness that's inside. And I think he's really um, does it in a gentle way, but brings all of that to light when you hang out with him. He's, even as friends, just hanging out, it's, it comes up all the time. So yeah, yeah. he doesn't he doesn't beat around the bush. No, no. Well, I, wanna, I definitely <laughs> want to dive into art, and uh, and obviously you're the you're the music man. So we're we're gonna dive deeply into music today. Yeah. Um, I've I've listened to the podcast you did with Pauls, and it was a while back. You guys just recorded a couple more, or, or that'll be lobbed into one big one. Yeah. And I don't, maybe that'll be out. If it is out, by the time this comes out, I'll link to that in the show notes as well, because okay. it's always great to get more of you when people want more <laughs> of you. And Paul's an excellent, excellent podcast host. But break it down for people who haven't heard you before on Paul's or anybody's that, that what was your story that drove you, the health story, into yeah. what you do now with music? Yeah. Well, I was always a musician and it was a big part of my life. And for a long, a a big chunk of my life, I ran a nonprofit called Homemade Genius uh, for almost 10 years, working with underserved kids with music and art lessons. And I saw the transformation that music had with these children. And it made me realize like there's something more here than just entertainment. It's, it's healing, it's therapeutic, it's powerful. Um, and so during that time, uh, Right after that, when I ended that nonprofit, I found myself kind of lost uh, in my mission. You know, I was like, what, what's next? But I, f- I also was starting to get ill, and it took about a year to be diagnosed, but I was ultimately diagnosed with MS and colon cancer. And I was severely overweight. I had played sports my whole life. Baseball was my, uh, you know, my favorite thing to do. I was a pitcher. And I had college scouts and professional scouts looking at me in 10th and 11th grade playing, you know, baseball. And I was running around the bases one day and passed out. You know, I was a, this was, the the thing that was interesting is that I was a pitcher that could hit. So I hit home runs, uh, ground rule doubles all the time. This way you had all the scouts watching you. That's right. Yeah. (laughs) And so, and I had a pretty good fastball and and, a good curve and change up and things. So I had diversity that they were looking for. And, um, a bigger guy. So it was like a, you know, big uh, pitcher that was a bigger guy that could bring the heat and hit, hit the ball. So yeah, I was running around the bases one day and just passed out and I ended up going to the hospital and they diagnosed me with mitral valve prolapse. It's like a a a valve problem, like an arrhythmia. And they said, it won't kill you, but when it happens, you can lose oxygen to the brain, all kinds of different things. So at that point, scouts were gone. They're just like done. <laughs> and so um, it was a depressing, you know, uh, thing to face. And so I just kind of had this dark night of the soul. I started hanging out with people, drinking, smoking, just, you know, kind of looking for that escape of life. And um, and so I, over the years of doing that, I just kept getting fatter and fatter, gaining weight and just uh, getting in an unhealthy position. And so when I did the nonprofit, it was something that gave my attention to that, but I wasn't doing the four doctors. I was just giving my time and doing uh, that one focus. Um, and when you give that much and you're not giving to yourself, building yourself, you hit that wall where the cup's like, there's nothing in here. (laughs) And so, so I found myself, uh, in a dark night of the soul where I was just, uh, 320 pounds, uh, of weight and, um, and just depressed and had a, a lot of, um, trauma and anger and resentment inside of me. And so I started listening. Uh, I remember being at the hospital, walking out of the emergency room for like the fourth, fourth time that year. 
Uh, and just being so frustrated, them not really being able to find, because it was at the very end when I got diagnosed with MS and colon cancer. I think I was almost $60,000 in debt uh, with because I was a musician that didn't have health insurance. Um, and it was just uh, a, a dark time. So I remember there was a book on the shelf, and it just, for some reason, coming home from the hospital at night, it just really stuck out to me. Pulled it off. My mom I was like, my mom's been telling me to read this book for... 10 years. And I'm like, I'll read it. And I never did. It was Louise Hay, You Can Heal Your Life. And I started reading it and just tears, you know, (laughs) it was like I connected with the message that was coming through. And someone about a week before that had given me the book, um, The Healing Power of Sound by Dr. Mitchell Gaynor. And that was so profound because it was a cancer doctor that was using singing bowls and a lot of different music sound therapies with his cancer patients. And they were having these huge transitions and transformations of their life. And so um, those two books I started reading simultaneously and it had this huge, it was just like the right moment, you know, it was like yeah. that eureka moment of just like, okay, I'm a musician I'm going to dive down this rabbit hole. And so I started getting into binaural beats and meditation. And the thing I found is I'm I'm a painter, a poet, a musician. My mind is always going. So when I would set to do meditation, I couldn't do it. I was just could not focus to get that quiet space. The binaural beats helped me do that. So when I put on the binaural beats with headphones and I sat there, I remember the first stillness moment, I was in my thirties, you know, I don't remember what year that was, but it was, uh, this, <laughs> you know, tears and just, you're sitting in the quiet of the storm. And I'm like, I've never known this my entire life. Like what this felt feels like to have peace, you know what I mean? Like, uh, of the mind or even in a, in that kind of space. And I grew up like touring and playing in bands and like sleeping and practice places where it's like metal and dungeon, you know, and it's just like, I I learned how to sleep in that. And so I never had peace, you know? And so that was just a huge moment where I remember talking to my mom on the phone one day and saying like, this has never happened to me. This is what happened and explained binaural beats. And so from that point forward, it was just diving down that rabbit hole of exploring that to its fullest extent and then changing the view of what do people want in an entertainment format of music to how can I face the demons, (laughs) you know, getting into, (laughs) you know, the shamanic drumming and something that was a consistent tone, like even pure tones, where it's just you're sitting with that and you're meditating on a note or a rhythm, just boom, boom, boom. And it's just monotonous and it just drills into your brain and you double down on that that drum or that tone and you start really meditating on it and it taught me how to set in silence and how to use rhythm or tone to block out you know I I call frequency the great disruptor so it's like it's something that really helps me to quiet the mind by just blowing out everything and you're left with nothing it's almost if like in the movie Inception how like you see the scene where the the sidewalks exploding, the buildings are exploding. It's like it's almost that's what frequency was doing for me. Is it was just exploding everything and just leaving me in that dark, you know, eyes closed, that that quiet of the mind. And so it was the first truly transformative thing I think that happened in my life when, on the spiritual journey. You know, that's massive. Yeah, yeah. My, my my first foray into meditation was dog shit, and it wasn't <laughs> until I got to binaural beats where I was like, oh, that's that's what they mean. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like my third took me two times in a float tank to feel anything other than just whoa, this is weird. I'm floating, <laughs> and then I remember it felt like five minutes. The light came on, and I was like, did I do something wrong? She was like, no, your time's up. And I was like, what are you talking about? It's been five minutes. She was like, oh, honey, come talk to me. You did great. You know, and I get out and she's like, that's, that's what you were shooting for. And I was like, holy shit. Um, It makes me think if you use like percussion tools, like Mm -hmm. a Theragun, the Theragun just with the, with the same consistent frequency and vibration, finally the nervous system just gives in and goes, ah, and unlocks, right? Like that's what I think binaural beats was doing for my brain. It was just enough from both sides to finally just go and surrender to it. Right. Yeah, there, I think people always ask me like, "What is the be- where is the best place to start?" And I honestly say every time binaural beats because 
it, it doesn't require anything from the listener and it does it automatically. And what it's doing is it's synchronizing the left and right hemispheres of the brain. Um, in the seventies, you had the, um, Monroe Institute that did the binaural beats and they called it hemisync technology. And, uh, that was really the first exposure I had to those. I was lucky. I had an uncle, uh, my uncle Paul is good friends with Drumvelo Melchizedek as well as uh, Alex Gray. <laughs> secret, secret, <laughs> secret, ancient secret of the flower life guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He and, knows some shit. Yeah, he does. And uh, my uncle is a professional sculptor and he's done sculptures for like Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous that have been on there. And, and like he did some stuff for Ron Rice, the owner of Hawaiian Tropics and stuff like that. But he's just, um, re- he got me into the Ascended Masters in like 2001, 2002. I was just a young young guy and he was just like pushing this stuff on me he sent me the flower of life books and got me into saint germain and you know all the all the uh wonderland he calls it Merkaba land like he has a place down in daytona where he brings people onto his property and they see all of his sculptures and he calls it Merkaba land that's just really cool <laughs> that's like a you got you got grandfathered into to one of the mystery schools yes you know like a modern mystery school. yes totally totally i was um it's it's so wild and it's neat because my family like my mom was raised christian and uh so she's like, I just don't understand what Paul's talking about. I'm like, well, when he's talking about UFOs and he's he's talking about, you know, the the ascended masters, I was like, it's just kind of part of his religion, the way, you know, Jesus is a part of yours. And I said, it's very similar. Like when he's sending you energy, he's praying for you, you know, like it's the same type of thing, but it's just neat because I've been put in that kind of uh, translator situation in the family. But I think it really helped me it diversified me to when I'm working with clients to be able to meet people where they're at. And I think that spirit provides those schoolings and teachings and lessons for you that set you, like when you're moving into a healer, most of the healers that I know have been through the thing that they're helping to heal. And then I think all the situations you look back and you're like, oh, that's why that happened. (laughs) (laughs) This is why these things happened to me so that I could be here and show up in this way for this set of people or or provide these tools for myself and for these other people. And I just think it's a it's a humbling process. It's just really cool to be a part of. Yeah, no doubt. And as the the it's, it reminds me, you know, when I went through the dark night of the soul, it, it was kind of a mind fuck because I was like, did this just happen? Did they just <laughs> did did they just change what Jung's quote was? Because yes. like I had only heard it right when I was going through it. But in order to reach into the highest levels of heaven, our roots must a tree's roots must dig down in the deepest levels of hell. Yeah, you know, like if it truly the best healers are the ones that have been through the muck. They're yeah. the ones that have done it themselves. That's how they can speak to it. It's how they can relate to it. You know. Paul helped me out big time. Um, and he was like, trust me, I've been there. And I was like, I believe you, but please illuminate, you know, just for my sake. And when <laughs> yeah. he illuminated, I was like, okay, you've been there. <laughs> Holy shit. All right, man. You know, like, like, no doubt. So I think that that is a, it's an invitation that we have from human to human where you can recognize that in yourself. And then also see in somebody else, like they made it through it. You know, Paul, Paul wrote, how do you move me healthy? He's had two kids. He's got two amazing wives. His, his life really progressed after that. Yeah. You know, there was light at the end of the tunnel there. Yeah. And his new book that he's working on, it's mind blowing, you know? Mind blowing. Yeah. Yeah. Mind blowing. Mind blowing. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. So I think like all of us who are sharing our stories, it's like, um, I had this conversation with one of my friends the other day who was a punk rocker, graffiti artist, truly amazing visual artist. And he was, um, giving gratitude for our friendship. And and I was telling him that he needs to share his story because he has a very unique perspective on prosperity and just manifestation. And, uh, I was telling him how proud I was of him and how far he's come. And he was like, nobody really cares about my story. And he's like, you know, you're at a level where you're growing and people enjoy you sharing your story. And I said, dude, Joe Dispenza, Bruce Lipton, Greg Braden, these guys, they're all pretty much sharing very similar stories, but they do it in a different, unique way. And it's they have unique experiences, but they're all pretty much saying the same thing. But the reason why different people connect with them is because they're different personalities, delivery styles flow, and it's so important for the message that's getting out there to be done in a diverse way because everybody needs something different, right? Just like yeah. there's different genres of music, you know, it's all, it's all music and it's all connecting to feeling and heart and, and empowerment. But 
it's done with those different genres. And so I think it's so important that people realize, like, it's important to share your story. It's important to share your story. Um, Paul and I were talking uh, this past week, you know, when I was at his, ho- at his house, and we were basically saying the retirement communities, there's so much knowledge there. You know, like, what if someone made a documentary just going, talking to everyday Joe about their life experience and things that they learned and that they would want to pass on to the younger generations. I mean, I can't even imagine, like you saw the uh, show Alive Inside where they, the, the, have you seen that? <laughs> There's a documentary called Alive Inside where they go to the retirement communities and they use music to awaken the dementia, you oh, know? Wow. Yeah. Uh, and it was really powerful. And you just see people who were non-responsive. They put the headphones on them, play the music from their era and it transports them back to that time and they'll set up eyes light up they start talking all this you know uh from that time period you know just talking about their friends their family they turn the music off they go back to the unresponsive state so it it was just really really powerful i can't imagine people being empowered to share their story and i think we're in a really amazing time where video and the internet gives this really unique possibility of sharing content that way yeah, that's phenomenal. I, th- I used to think about that from uh, right when I first got into podcasting. You know, like I don't, I was the a smaller guy on the defensive line at ASU. I was a smaller guy in fighting. I had to drop to light heavyweight from heavyweight because Kane and Daniel Cormier were were right there in my weight class, teammates of mine that became heavyweight champion. And I was always around guys that were bigger than me, so yeah. I don't think of it that way. But I remember there was a uh, one of the first few times I had done ayahuasca. It was a day ceremony at a Native American reservation, and as I was being escorted back from like two barely five foot tall Hispanic ladies, you know, were carrying me basically back to my, my seat. Uh, a woman passed by who didn't speak a lick of English and she goes, uh, she goes, the Hulk, the Hulk. And she's pushing, you know, pointing at me and I was, and I just cracked up. I was like, damn, this lady thinks I'm the Hulk. But they, legitimately like on ayahuasca looking at my friend, I was like, whoa, yeah, it was the first time I really understood uh, my avatar through the eyes of someone else. Right. You know, not through my inner circle of people that I hang out with all day, but through, you know, like the, the eyes of a very small lady, you yeah. know? Yeah. And um, I remember when uh, Dorian Yates first went on London Real and then Rogan's talking about his experiences, how important that was for bros in the bodybuilding community that are just like, no, you know, patch it up, pussy, lift weights, you know, that kind of thing, right? Yeah, it's yeah. like, like uh, because he was the, one of the greatest bodybuilders of all time, they would lend an ear to that, right? Because there's a level of respect and admiration for him that that might not come from Louise Hay, right? right? And then, you know, people that are following Louise Hay might not want to pay attention to Dorian Yates. So they go, oh, this guy's a dumb bodybuilder, you know, yeah. not realizing he's brilliant, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, every every thread in the quilt matters. It does, yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I think that's what the pattern, the flower of life speaks to me, is all the interlocking circles. If you took one of those circles out, it would look incomplete. Yeah. But when you see them all together working as a team it's and you stand back from it and you look at it, you can really see the interconnectedness of life. And I, to me, that's what I take from that symbol. And then you get into the whole mathematic when you explode it out into a 3D, you, you see that it contains pretty much everything that there is, you know. Um, but it's just really neat to see that, the interlocking circles. I think it's 19 interlocking circles, I believe. I can't remember, but yeah. I, so it's it's really powerful image for me. You know, I think yeah. it's what it, it, it expresses to me. That's amazing. So yeah. talk about this, this transition point where, um, when was it, you know, from, from you're working with the nonprofit and you're, you're not healthy and then at some point you end up, you know, falling into the Jernvalo Melchizedek <laughs> squad yeah. and getting the deeper downloads. At which point did you start um, after Binaural Beats? Did you say, this is where I'm going to shift? And yeah. This is where I'm going to dive deep in. And what were your influences then? Well, it's always interesting because I think um, people are, with my company listening to smile, people are always like, where was the start of this where you're like, I'm doing this. And I said, spirit did it. Like I, 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 all I really knew is that this had a profound effect on me. And I started hosting these events at yoga studios. Um, and we haven't got into this, but when I started listening to smile, I was actually homeless. So, Whoa. yeah. <laughs> so, so what happened was I had $60,000 of doctor bills. Um, I was, I had no money. I was just running out of 
of money and I was at my apartment uh, and knew I was going to be evicted the next month. And uh, this, I had this meeting. This is how spirit works, right? So I had this meeting and there was a lady that was in the spiritual community, an older lady that we had a, a meeting at my house that day. And I just, it was made months before totally forgot about it just with everything that was going on with me and she showed up and she she could just tell the face was just stressed and um you know she basically was uh there and lent some counsel uh (laughs) to the situation but it was just a very um profound thing And, and when I say I was homeless I went through uh living under a bridge and dreaming up, listening to smile. I was lucky enough to have friends that I could crash on their couch or take a shower here and there, but most of the time uh, was outside. And in that time period, uh, I think you really find out who you are. And and there was a lot of things that I think I could have done differently, but I, for some reason I chose to face this in this way. And, uh, I, when I think back about that time, I think about it was almost like you felt like you were a fighter pilot that got shot down behind enemy lines and you are on your own. And it's just basically like there is no hero coming to save you. You know you're a smart, intelligent person and you have these talents. What can you do to make a difference in the world and to pull yourself out of this hole that you've chosen to go into? <laughs> And so, so yeah, so basically I started thinking as a musician, I knew I really wanted to do something with music, but when you look at the industry right now, it's decimated, you know, it's, it's very hard to make a living as a musician. And, um, and so I started just dreaming up if I didn't think inside the, the box of the formats and templates that are out there, how could I do it? And so that was really giving Um, a lot of thought and attention and focus to um, how can I create a synergistic platform that supports me as a musician and my creations and what I'm out, you know, the output versus the people who I wanted to share the music with. So I started having conversations with yoga studios and uh, massage practitioners and just holistic practitioners in general. If I made this music and let's say that it was, sound healing based, you know, frequency based music, but I created all these genres like hip hop and trip hop and, you know, um, pop music and folk music and curtain and shamanic drumming, and I could create a catalog. How could you utilize that? You know, and, and they would say stuff like, Oh, put it on hold music and the, in the studio space, use it in my one-on-one sessions for coaching, um, my yoga studio, you know, and then I was like, what if you could sell it to your clients? You know, like they come in, they have this experience. And so it just started from there. And then I just started thinking, fuck it, let's just put the whole shebang. We'll create a multi-function, you know, multi-use license. I'll own the catalog. I don't have to use a record label or a publisher and I'll just privately license this to you for a flat fee. And then you'll have all these options to monetize it and to utilize it in a, in a way. And so <laughs> when I first started doing it, everyone's like, it's never going to work. This is crazy, you know, and this isn't what BMI or ASCAP or, you know, these performing rights organizations. And they're like, there's no way to do this or to track it. Or, and so I just started, you know, moving forward inch by inch. And I, and I remember the secret, there's a guy that was talking about the headlights on the highway. Do you remember that? It was, he was saying that, you can only see in the darkness, you know, a certain amount in front of you. And he's like, you don't know what's down the road. And, but right now you're focused on just getting the next mile, half mile, whatever, you know, you can see with your lights. And I, that vision of like, I didn't know how it was going to happen, but I knew that I wanted to move in this direction. So I just started moving with no safety net with, I mean, I was all right, what else can I lose? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I just kept doing it. And I remember the first time we sold out our first yoga studio, there was, uh, it was on Daniel island and uh in south carolina it's a you know pretty affluent uh, area there in charleston and um yeah the yoga studio was like man this was amazing like there's so many people out the door we couldn't even fit them in here and like what, we need to do another one you know and so and so it just kept growing to where people started coming to me like oh i want to use your music and people were contacting me within three months from Australia saying they saw it on Facebook and they wanted to bring it out there. And I just kept saying, no, no. And then I could just hear spirit talking to me like, Hey dummy, 
I'm trying to help you, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, and so I was like, okay, God, I'm going to create this program. And I started. I had a good friend named Boyd who was really great at um, scalabilities of business. He had attended law school and just really smart guy. And so we started having these conversations. And he's like, dude, do you know what you've done? Like, you know, he was just like, you've created something that's. He's like, this is multi million dollar business, you know. And I was like still in homeless mode. I'm like, yeah, man, I don't know. Like, we'll, <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, and so it's like, it just started growing. And I think Spirit just did this amazing thing where he started, she, he just brought these people into my life uh, that were just monumental and moving forward. And I've seen it, like, getting on to Paul Check, it just really exploded from his podcast. I think four or five new countries came on board. Um, just a lot of people. I mean, uh, Brittany and I met from the podcast, tons of people coming into my life, just really excited. And I think that it's just every step of the way, you know, being here with you, I've, I've watched your podcast. It's an amazing thing to be here with you. And it's just so humbling to see spirit put together these dots and connect these networks. And I think this is the change, the ripples that are happening is from people like you and me having these ideas putting it into motion, not knowing what's going to happen and just having faith and trusting in it. And then spirit saying, I got you putting all these people together. And I just think it's a magical thing, man. Absolutely. magical. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. it's, I think it's magical too, that you're, you're as the download started coming in for you, it was the whole picture. It wasn't just, I mean, it wasn't like the, the ending of it, right? Yeah. You only got what was in front of you, but you got the thread that led to the whole picture. It wasn't the thread to make this amazing music and then fucking wrap your head around how you're going to get it out to people. Yeah. Right? Like you saw the bigger picture on, hey, this is, this is what's working. This is what's not working in the music industry. And you can perhaps give people some, some <laughs> give people an idea around how Spotify and some of these other, other things work because really you were solving multiple problems at once. Yeah. Well, a lot of, I think most people, so Napster, like, let's talk about that real quick. So when I was younger, Napster came along and it was this great thing, right? People were like, oh, all this music. And so I started having these conversations recently with friends and I said, man, how many songs did you download from Napster that you never listened to? And they were like, what do you mean? And I'm like, you downloaded thousands of songs, I'm sure. And I said, all of us did. You know, we were all like, oh, free music, you know. And so I said, but there was so much stuff that sat on my hard drive and never listened to. I never got to it because I put nothing into that exchange. I didn't have a value for what was sitting there. And the things I started realizing, the things that I paid for, bought, attended, I put more value in and I put more of my time commitments to those to, to oversee it. If I paid for a program for like a hundred bucks, I might be like, oh, I'm busy. I don't, you know, I'm not going to get to it. If I paid 10 grand for a program, you better bet I'm going to spend time with that program. And I think there's a value in that, in that exchange. I'm supporting the person who's taken the time and energy and the pain and trials and tribulations to birth this thing and bring it to the world. And then I'm putting money into that. And I'm saying, hey, this is valuable to you. Keep doing it. But also to me, hey, you spent money on this. You better, <laughs> you know, see this through, right? And so I think like Napster wiped all of that away, you know. But I think what ended up happening as a, a other side, flip side of that coin is that the music industry was not ready for the internet and the power that it was going to hold in the marketplace. So they lost the market. The tech industry took it over, you know, Apple with Apple, uh, iTunes, and then you had Spotify and YouTube and all these things that came up with the streaming platforms. And so as a consumer, you're like, yes, nine bucks a month. I can listen to anything I want. But, you know, you think about it in perspective. When I came up, 10 bucks, you know, wasn't even, you couldn't even buy a CD for that. And that would be one album, you know? And so the value system is so far skewed uh, in the favor of the industry um, that artists, we're losing amazing, amazing talent because they're like going to get real jobs and we're losing this artistry and this magic in the world because people are feeling the need to abandon things that they could make a decent living at, uh, but because the industry is so far skewed. So to give you an idea, like um, Spotify... You know, it, they're. Tr I think they just lost a lawsuit in court, so it's probably going to be changing a little bit. But still, 
uh, for the whole time Spotify has been around, you're looking at 1 million streams for 3,000 US dollars. And so most artists will never reach a million streams because they don't have the PR marketing to do that. And I think another thing to think about is 40,000 songs a day come out new every day on, on Spotify. So you think about that as an artist trying to get your music out there. So most artists' catalogs are sitting on there for free. Uh, where people can listen to it and there's no real exchange uh, of, (laughs) you know, synergistic exchange there. So I think like when a lot of musicians have started seeing what I'm doing and that I think the first year we did this, it was like $53,000 or something. Um, And so as a musician, I was like, holy crap. How many millions (laughs) would you have needed? How many millions of listeners on Spotify would you need to achieve that? Yeah, yeah. And so it just started growing each year, you know, going up. And it was, it gave me hope. And then I think other musicians are starting to look at what I'm doing and saying, uh, wow, there could be something here. And I think when they're approaching me, they're like, what should I do? And I'm like, pull your stuff from the platforms and create your own platform and start investing in events and opportunities that you're engaging people and engage, engage people. Even if it's 10 people, you're going to have better engagement than a thousand people on Spotify because the way Spotify is set up is they're pulling, people don't realize this, but what they're doing is by playlists, they're separating you from the artist. So what I mean by that is, and this is the first phase, right? So what I mean by that is if I said someone's like, oh, I listen to stuff on Spotify all the time. I'm like, what do you listen to? Such and such playlist. I'm like, name some artists off that playlist. I don't know. You know, I don't know what it is. And so the the reason why I'm saying that is then you're going to get to a point where they're introducing AI artists where um, I, I saw an article where Google was working on the Beatles, YouTube and, and Google were working on taking the entire catalog feeding it through AI, changing the chord progressions just enough that it couldn't be copyrighted by the Beatles. And so they were putting out stuff that was very similar to the Beatles. So that they're, And they're just, we're, we're trying this out. We're seeing how, where it's going. But I think like the detriment to musicians is uh, there's not an investment in the up and coming talent that it's like a, a football team. You're investing everything in the varsity and you're giving to all these big, artists you're giving them the top spots on the platforms aerosmiths all you know rolling stones these people are fading out what's next you know what's coming in next and i think they're investing in ai because they're cutting out royalties and dealing with the artists and they can just take it straight to the platform charge you money for the music and it's close enough to the stuff that you like and so for me as an artist it's i'm just like this is blasphemy <laughs> you know yeah. like so i think like um it's just really important for people to realize investing in your friends and your family that are doing creative things in the world because it's needed. It creates, I think art is one of the most magical things in the world because it creates an interaction with the soul and feelings first before anything else. And I think that it's, it's um, a, a universal language and it can inspire massive amounts of change in people. I mean, you see it, I mean, in ceremonies, you know, uh, plant medicine, I, I feel like one of the highest points for me in those ceremonies is music. And I think it's it interacts in a way that you, in those moments, truly feel. I was having a conversation with, with Brittany and I basically was saying it just ripples through you. When you, in that state, when you have a, a, a thought, it's like instantaneously ripples through the whole body and you can feel it in a way that you're not conscious of in everyday life. And so people uh, are like, oh, I don't do that because I'm afraid of this or I don't want to have a bad trip. And I'm like, but it's here. You know what I'm saying? Like every time for me, uh, you know, I can feel the anxiety or these different things, like depending on how deep you're going that come up. And as soon as it comes up, if I can meet it and say, oh, I know what you're doing here, friend, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and you have that reverse, like you send it love, uh, you can feel it. It's just like the change is instantaneous. And I think for me, the plant medicine has been such a, a great opportunity for me to start an everyday life, pinpointing those becoming more sensitive to those things in life where I can say, Oh, I see you. I'm not, you know, it's like, um, yeah. So it's just, it's really cool to see, um, artistry moving in a way that there's people trying to do something different outside of the system. You know what I mean? Like to pull, pull that back, um, to the artist. But I think it's important for our friends, family, and colleagues 
the world to start realizing the value. Um, and I'll say this to close this. I think creatives are the architects of this reality. You know what I'm saying? Like you have architecture, fashion, you know, dance, poetry, music, uh, visual arts. And it's like it literally shapes people's perception of what this reality is. And it has been uh, confiscated or manipulated um, by the one percenters. And they're using our gifts against us, you know, to shape and transform uh, consciousness. And I think that's the battle that's going on right now is for your conscious uh, suppression, you know? Yeah. And so I think, like, for art, you know, that's the thing. These are the last revolutionaries right now. You know what I'm saying? And there's no one speaking out like there were in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and it's like the punk movement and metal movements in the 80s had very loud, boisterous bands that were speaking out against the government, against, you know, social, you know, uh, suppression. And and now, you, you know, like you see the Dixie Chicks speak out against Bush and then they're blacklisted and they're just wiped off the map. And, you know, I saw Rage Against Machines started touring again and then the singer got hurt, and I don't, I don't know what happened after that. And it's just interesting to me. I'm like, hmm, interesting. <laughs> so well, there's just Rage, Rage Against the Machine, from my understanding, kind of went hook, line, and sinker with the narrative in the last yes, couple of years. For which sure. Is fucking mind blowing. I know. The mind vaccinations. Yeah. The last people on earth, I would have thought. Yeah, I, I remember. I, <laughs> they exa- do what they told you. They could do what they told you. Like, what, what are you doing? Do you not see the irony in this at all? Yeah, I, I remember that same thought of like where it's said something about you had to be vaccinated to go to their show and i was just thinking like wow that's very you know it's not it's not what you would expect at all yeah no. yeah so um but yeah i think that music and art and poetry and all of it um is really powerful for helping to shift focus and consciousness and i just think it's a it's a powerful tool and it's not being utilized right now yeah, yeah. It, is, it is the last stand. It is interesting, you know, with your with your point on people not really speaking out. We've got the, you know, the formation of the Ministry of Truth, you know, like in Potter yeah. <laughs> in our government right now. There's a lot of things that are, especially with uh, the way Paul and I talk, that get us a little 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 squirrely having kids, you know, <laughs> wanting to look out for them and yeah. not not uh not overstep the bounds. But um, there's never been a more important time to speak out either, you know. Yeah. And uh, I think about, you know, did you ever see the Lego movie? Yes. Remember that? So mm-hmm. they got the everything is awesome. That's AI music in a nutshell, <laughs> right? That's what they're going to create. They're going to yeah. create the lamest top 40 bullshit that hooks you at the right beat frame that they've they've mapped, you know, consciously. They're like, oh, this is the thing that's going to get people energized. They're ready to go to work and pay attention and, and have fun at their shit job and, <laughs> you know, go get hammered on the weekend, right? Like yeah. that's, that's all that gearing is going towards that. And... um even some of the art, you know, it's like, wow, that's pretty cool. Some of the some of the art. I, mean, I forget who it was. Somebody just won an art contest, um, but there was a lot of pushback because he had used um, AI or machine learning in in his art. You know, and it's yeah. beautiful, but it was also like not necessarily completely him. Yeah, you know. And I think about that. Like my art isn't. There's nothing to write home about it. But <laughs> I every painting I've done encapsulated me at a particular moment in my life where something big was happening. And, and uh, you know, I could, it draws me right back into that, you know, and it speaks to me. It speaks to my family because it draws us back to these, these critical moments. I don't paint all the time, but I'll paint when something big's coming. Yeah. And that, that, sometimes I'm painting things before I even know what the fuck it is. Right. And it's like two or three years later, I'm like, oh, that was it. I'll get, on a, <laughs> I'll get in a plant medicine journey. I'm like, that was it. That's what, that's what I felt coming. You know, and I think of that, the, the style that you bring forward too is something important to talk about. Um, when you start layering in you, you know, like yeah. the, the progress that you make from clearing of the room to dialing in to, to the music that you make, I think would be fantastic to bring up here. Yeah. Well, I think what's interesting, I'll say this to on two points you brought up there. Uh, I, I was talking to Paul about Bob Dylan and I said, if we went by today's standards, like the voice... Bob Dylan would never even have a seat at the table. And I think that we've created this real cookie cutter thing to determine what talent is, you know? And when I think about, I was really fortunate. My dad um, 
showered me with music. I mean, when my dad passed away, I got like 20 plus instruments, uh, you know, from him and uh, over 2000 vinyl records. And I remember my mom telling a story. She said when they got married, they were 18 and they had this budget that they were working with. And she'd be like, here's your lunch money. Here's this. And, you know, they would split and just had a tight budget and they were like really shoestringing it to, to go through life. And uh, mom said that dad would never eat and save his money. And at the end of the week, he'd go buy a bunch of records at the store and then he would just be in the floor, like listening to the records, like, you know, just deep listening, checking out the artwork. And like, that was his life. She did, he just loved music. And so I think about how much music means to people and recently I've had some friends who are musicians who are like, oh, I'm not as good as you, or you write so many songs and able to do it so easy. And I'm like, yeah, man, but I've been doing this for, since I was 20, I'm 45. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was like, I've put time into this, you know, like you're just getting started, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I was like, I, I was like, you're going to get there. But I said, the things that people are telling you, like your rhythm is very unique. It's not like mine. It's not like stuff I've heard, but that's your gift. Like double down on this. Like you have this unique style, bring something new into the world. Don't be like them, be like you. And so I think like my biggest thing that I'm trying to help people with that are coming to me, whether it's clients through one-on-one -on -one sessions or whether it's like musicians that are, you know, coming, like we're interacting through creation processes and then they see how I'm doing things differently. And they're like, well, this isn't how this recording studio did that. And I'm like, good. I'm, I'm you know, it's like, <laughs> and so it's like, you know, I'm like, your rhythm is so unique. Double down on that, play it because that's you, that's your rhythm. It's unique and it's uniqueness is what makes amazing music, right? So Bob Dylan was a great storyteller. It didn't matter that his voice was weird, you know what I mean? But he wrote cool stories and like expressed that and changed people through those stories. And um, uh, don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows, you know, one of his lyrics, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so it's like, I think when I think back about bands like Frank Zappa, or The Doors, there's never going to be a band where you're like, man, they sound like Frank Zappa or they sound like The Doors because they're such unique music. And I think that's what we should be pushing our children to do is to be disruptors, to be, you know, creative thinkers and to be unique individuals because that is what the ripples, you know what I'm saying? The people who dare to dream and to push into those areas of uniqueness is what is awesome. And so for me with my music... I look at all that and, you know, I'm, I'm looking at Joe Dispenza, Bruce Lipton, Greg Braden. I'm looking at Buckminster Fuller and Wilhelm Reich and these people that wrote these amazing books and put this stuff in the world that people just thought was batshit crazy. But I'm like <laughs> reading it and I'm like, this is fucking awesome, you know? And so, but I'm taking those th same type of concepts and trying to put it into my music. And at the same time, like, breaking away from verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, end of song, this template. So a lot of times there's people, when I first started making this music, they'd be like, this isn't really meditation music. And I'm like, you're right, it's not. I'm, I'm wanting a soundtrack for your life, not just on the yoga mat, not just before you go to bed or when you're meditating, but when you're walking your dog, when you're out lifting weights when you're when you're at the gym when you're uh you know cleaning your house you know <laughs> like i want you to have frequency music that is giving you the same type of thing that you're getting on the meditation uh cushion or the yoga mat as you are through the rest of your day and so it was just really creating something and then not listening to people like cuz everyone people <laughs> no one was doing it yeah and and people didn't like the name like listening to smile they were telling me I should change the name they didn't like the music this that and i just in my heart i knew this is what i wanted to do and so it was just pushing into that and i think i got to a point where i just realized like if i make a mistake and it doesn't work at least it was my decision i remember when i was younger listening to people and then something not working out and then feeling really resentful and angry because I listened to someone else and didn't follow Double my heart. Me. Yes, yes. And so um, for me, I think my music is really pushing the envelope on structure. There's sometimes I've had songs that have seven changes and there's no nothing that repeats. Sometimes there's something that repeats and there's these little inflections or these things and people will have comments and I'm like, I hear you. And there's people who will say, this was darker. This wasn't, uh, 
as as pretty as your other stuff. And I'm like, you're right. I wanted it to bring out darkness. I wanted it to help with the shadow work. And I said, in the descriptions, you can read. We go there. We talk about <laughs> why. Look first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, and so I think like not being afraid to do that. And I think um, when you're like uh, Coldplay, Coldplay has the, you listen to their albums and for the most part there is a template and they deliver music and they're a good pop band, you know, and they have their their audience. But imagine if they decided to do something completely radically different, how many people they would lose. So in the beginning, you get to a point where fuck it, let's do do whatever. People are going to like it or they're not going to like it. But when you get to an established place of 10 years, 15, 20 years in, then you get into this scarcity of like, oh no, what if I create something and no one likes it? And it's it's a harsher reality. But I think this progress of listening to Smile, this will be the seventh year in November that I've been doing this. The first two years were really, almost three years, were really trying to climb out of the hole of being homeless, establish it. And the last, you know, four years have been really, like we're in nine different, ten different countries now with our music and <clears throat> really have got to a place where a lot of practitioners um, are using this. And we just got Cliff Bar as a client. So we're working with a mindfulness program with Cliff Bar. And so it's opened some other doors uh, to some other companies. And it's really, you're getting to a point where I'm sitting there saying, ooh, I want to create stuff that people are going to like, but I have to go to that place of that unique individual and say, if they don't like it, then they're not supposed to be here. Like this yeah. is this is my thing that I feel very connected to and in my heart space, this is my mission. And I have to walk that line, you know what I mean? No matter what that means. And sometimes it, it might be tricky, but um, I think that's one of the biggest things I'm doing with my music is to really, um, I call it the LTS method. So basically what I'm doing is I'm taking binaural beats and so I'm using that to f facilitate whatever target focus we're working for, for the heart rate and the brainwave activity. And then I'm introducing a carrier, you know, it's, that is the carrier frequency. And then we're introducing a mono beat on top of that. So for me, I feel like it delivers that mono beat in a very powerful way. And it's why people say, like, when they put on the headphones, like, your music sounds so much more full than, like, regular music. And, and I'll just laugh and I'll say, well, it's this these binaural beats. And so it's a, it's a tritone, not in a musical term, but just the, the three harmonic, you know, that we're working with there. Um, and then that is the root foundation of the songs. And so I put the song structure on top of that. We tune the instrument. So I'm, I'm utilizing acoustic instruments and, and tools like gongs, tuning forks, singing bowls, things like that, and didgeridoos, but also, you know, real, acoustic drums we're we're utilizing guitars and and things like that but we're also using synthesizers and beat machines and we're creating a, a mix between the modern and the ancient you know uh sound tools and so you're getting things like we're we're taking like a wu-tang type beat and putting it on top of like uh a, a, a a kora, which is a African harp and like a sitar and like blending styles and different fusions of music together in this. And and I think that when people hear it, they're like, oh, interesting. This is sound healing. And I'm like, it is. <laughs> and so it's like, and so, you know, but what I'm finding is that more and more people that I think would not have traditionally got into meditation music are getting introduced to this upbeat mid-tempo stuff. And they're like, oh, this is pretty cool. It does make me feel a certain way. I'm going to try these meditation tracks now. And then they're like, oh, this is, you know, it's like really hitting hard for them. And so I think for me, that's my biggest accomplishment is getting people into meditation that probably never would have found it before. And so I think for me, like not being a meditation person and the binaural beats helping me to see the benefit of that and to how to quiet the mind, um, those are the people I'm wanting to connect with, I think, the most, just because I understand what it's like to be there. Yeah. Oh, well, I think you're in good company too, following your own path. Yeah. yeah. You know, like the Beatles <laughs> changed their tune quite a bit from starting off ultra pop into really <laughs> becoming artists by the end of it. Right. Uh, Queen, you know, in the, in the movie, they went over, you know, all the, all the, um, the record labels that were like, you can't do a fucking eight minute song or 11 minute song. It's <laughs> yeah. like, no, this is what we're doing. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. to know that in your heart and then just say, this is what we're doing. Right. And it's going to land. Right, you know, like there, mm -hmm. there, there's some legends that have that have, that have yeah. proved that path. So, right, it's really cool that, that you've known that all the way through. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think um, when I when I'm playing an instrument like a guitar, um, and I think this is the recording studio is almost another instrument. Like when you when we're talking about the Beatles, George uh, Martin, their producer. Uh, there's like Eleanor Rigby would not even be a song without him. You know what I mean? Like he wrote the string arrangements and then Paul brought the song, the lyrics in and they put it down and what a, you know, iconic song, you know what I mean? Um, so the recording studio for me, uh, I was in bands and just wrote my part I played guitar. I just wrote my part and showed up. And I remember when one of my bands broke up. I was like, man, I'm like jonesing for music, you know, I want to play music. But I was always just the person that showed up, played his part, and that was it. You know, I didn't really get much into the music. I didn't get very much into the ego and, like, care who got credit for this. I just wanted to play and be in front of people. And when that band broke up, I bought a four-track, and I started playing with, like, I had an upright piano and, like, acoustic guitar. And I was like, oh, man. So I, as you start piecing the songs together, you start seeing... The, the songwriting process, you know, start unfolding. And so then it got to a point where if I played a part, like on guitar, I would start hearing in my head the bass line, the drum, the drum beat. The, and so I wanted to learn how to play those other instruments to start doing it myself because I was um, really cut off from music at that time because I went through the breakup with the, the band and we just weren't playing. And I was in a small town where there wasn't a bunch of musicians. So the the availability of that was just really limited so i started doing it myself and i i think like it's the one thing that changed my life monumentally because i i think it it it, it allowed me the ability to deconstruct a song i would listen to the beatles songs in that the next time after this process and I would just notice like I could single out the baseline in my head. I could just put everything else at bay and like pull it to the front. And so it was like this fine tuning of my listening skills started changing. And, and, uh, then when I would start mixing, I started learning how to mix and master the music myself because I wanted, as I learned more about conspiracy, uh, fact right yeah, uh i started i started i started learning that there the was a note yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so i started saying like what if i started learning how to mix and master my music to where i had full control and no one could put anything unwanted in my music um at the mastering houses or any of that it took me about 12 years it was a long process to really feel like i got to a good point with it that i felt good but i started noticing like I was working with other engineers and I would like hear stuff and I'm like, do you hear that? And they're like, no. And I'm like, it's like a hiss. And they're, they're like, no, I don't hear anything. And then like I would solo out the kick drum and it would be like, Shh. and they're like, dude, how did you hear that? Like that, and it's like, I started noticing like real subtle things. And I started seeing the difference that the recording process started having on me as an artist. And I think it really changed my ability not only in the music field, but like in life, I would start noticing more and more things like um, the the trees, the leaves and the breeze where I hadn't really noticed that before. And, you know, it would just kind of be like, oh, it's mundane stuff. I don't, you know, I'm not tuning into it. And I think like all of those processes and then sharing this music with clients, people two weeks, three weeks in will say, man, you know, I feel like I'm noticing more things in my environment, like this 528 pure tone, I heard a plane flying overhead the other day and there was like this, this hum from the engine and it sounded very similar to this tone or my refrigerator is humming at night and I, and it has this tone and I put them together and they're really close. And, and it's just really neat because I think like sound has such an ability, like in the beginning there was the word, right? So it has this ability that it sculpts and molds this construct that we're in this this perceived reality everything is light and vibration of sound and light right there's a it, it, everything's frequency so i think that when people start really working on meditating on a note or meditating on a frequency or a tone it starts unraveling these other things where conscious you, the brain is saying hey you've been listening to this frequency for a while you're telling me it's important let me help you see it in reality and these things in the external. And so I think it starts, the awareness expands and in turn the consciousness starts expanding. And I think sound is such a powerful tool for that. 
Yeah, it's massive. Yeah. It's reminded me of one of Paul's favorites, uh, Stalking the Wild Pendulum by Ishtak Bentov. Have you mm-hmm. read that? No. Yeah, he, he right in the beginning, he breaks down the logos and, and how if everything is vibration, um, you could say that you could call sound all sound is light or you could say all light is sound. Right. right? So mm-hmm. if you consider it all to be sound at varying degrees of what's perceivable and imperceivable, it's all the song. Right? Yeah. It's the song of the universe, one song. Yes. You know? And that, that's pretty... It's a mind-blowing thought to 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 grapple with and to, to to viscerally know. You know that's something plant medicines did for me too. It didn't turn me into a musician, but it, it directed the power of music to me in a way that was like, all right, I had my favorites growing up. My mom did a great job of playing, you know, Billy Idol, Billy Joel, uh, Elton John, Phil Collins. She had all, you know, she yeah. had a lot of the different varieties and, and oldies too, Three Dog Night and all that stuff. But um, with my kids especially, you know, like we'd have instruments and i've bought you know guitar center center sorry guitar center but i've bought you know their 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 black friday sales and it's like i need to fucking give this to goodwill yeah you know like mm-hmm. let me let me save up what's it whatever is necessary for a handmade steel pan hand drum like yeah. whatever that's going to cost like it's going to be worth it to have a real instrument in the house yeah and one that's durable for the right. kids but like just to come around and, and play even a few notes like the tone of that it, it's a it's it moves beyond the ears. Like yeah. it hits every part of your body, yeah. right? And I didn't understand that until ayahuasca, you know, and there, then uh, my first few journeys, they were playing an iPod. But the second I heard a real instrument live on ayahuasca, I was like, holy shit. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, and the ikros, you know, the vibratory notes that they're able to, to hit in their range penetrates you, you yeah. know, and like to recognize that's still happening even if I'm not on medicine and right. not taking in the full gamut of that, I'm still absorbing the full gamut of that. Yeah. You know, it's such a powerful tool. It is. Um, th- what you just talked about is for me, uh, when I'm working with clients, people are like, so I can just watch TV and put this, this on. And I'm like, well, you can, <laughs> but, <laughs> but what I would like to see is you to start evolving your deep listening skills. And that means not multitasking, setting aside, a ceremony with this music and yourself. And I said, give yourself quiet space, you know, give yourself time away from people and really dive into how your body's feeling when you start listening to this, noticing. And one of the things I really encourage people to do is journal after they've spent some time with a track because each, let's say that every morning they gave 10 minutes before they got their day started listening to a track and they journaled and they go back at the end of the month and they look at how that same track affected them differently each day and p- different areas of the body were affected. They felt different stagnant energies moving. They felt their day changed because their mood was this way or, you know, and it's like you start really developing a relationship and the people who have spent time, like I have a, one of the guys at Cliff Bar that facilitates the um, meditations for the, the uh, employees there. He was like, I've been listening to the same track for six months. And he's like, have you done that? And I said, yes. And so he and so he was like, what did it do for you? And I said, I cried every day for six months when I was coming out of being, you know, heavy, 320 pounds. The first year I lost 100 pounds. And I said, I think I cried it up way. I think I literally just had tears from listening to 528, which is the frequency of love. I listened to that track, the same one every day. And you develop this intimacy. It's, you know, it's, it's just like the world today. It's like everything is used up. Let's, let's get a new girlfriend. Doesn't work out, throw her away, get a new one, just go through the same process of this. But if you really doubled down and said, hey, I'm going to show up for this uncomfortable, have this conversation, Let's get to a deeper understanding, deeper intimacy. Let's go to a new place um, that I haven't gone before. It's going to be scary, but let's do it together. You know, you find someone that you can do that with. And for me, like the music, like if you choose, it's a choice, right? Just like it is in the relationship. I choose, this person has a good heart. This person's kind. This person's loving. This person's shown up for me in a powerful way. I'm choosing you. There are all these other choices that I could make. I'm choosing you to double down and to go into this uncomfortable darkness shadow work and fix both of us by these conversations being open, right? And for me, music is the same way. If you, there's music that you'll hear the first line of the lyric, it's like, tears you know you just like connect with it i remember the there's this band called the red house painters and the guy had this lyric that said i can't let you be 
because your beauty won't allow me wrapped in white sheets like an angel from a bedtime story. And I was like, fucking poetry. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like powerful stuff. And there's, there's people who've had trauma or I've had army veterans that will connect with songs because of tones. It's something that just brings something out of them. Like, why is this happening? And I'm like, there's a lot of explanations for this, but I said, it probably has something to, you're listening to the Chakra Tune Up album. And I said, you're having a lot of issues around your root and your solar plexus, you know? And I said, empowerment issues, you know, the way that you see yourself, the groundedness, you know, like if you've been uh, in worry, doubt and fear and pain and depression, it's like grounding is something that you desperately need. When you feel that, you, that, that track kicks on and you feel that and you haven't had it for a while, it's going to feel like you're being hugged. You know, you're, you're being uh, enveloped in that tone and it can be very uh, emotional, you know? And so I think the hardest part for, there's not a lot of men doing this work. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and I say that in my circle, I'm saying most of the people that I know, uh, I have a, fr my friend Boyd, he's like, Ian, you're like an alpha male. You, f you seem, you, but it's stealth. Like he's like, it's like you're a stealth alpha male. You come in and you're very calm and you're so chill that no one like really thinks anything about you. But then when you have these conversations, it's like, whoa. And it's like engaging. And, and, and he's like, you are leading people to this new place. And I feel like I have mentors like Paul and, and Jason, you know, our, yeah. our mutual friend. And there's just a lot of people who I was telling Brittany, I'm so fortunate that I have these very balanced powerful men in my wheelhouse of people that are just helping to hold space for me through every turn. But I'm looking at a lot of men who, uh, you know, my friend that is the, the uh, graffiti artist, we've had conversations and I'm like, man, stop picking up chicks at bars, dude. Like holistic centers, yoga studios, go and invest in yourself and meet someone that's investing in themselves. You know what I'm saying? And like get to a point where um, you're coming at it from a healthier place instead of just chasing tail. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so it's like, but men have such a hard time, I think, expressing in my world, in my circle, there's a lot of men that just ha have a lot of uh, reserved, you know, suppression around, um, being vulnerable and, and crying and, and saying like, Hey, I cried, you know, like it's hard for them to even say that. And like, Oh, I don't cry. I'm, I'm tough. You know? I'm fine. And so I think that, um, this music is a thing that like tears those walls down. And I think that it helps you set in that quiet of the mind. It's almost like you're observing the ego and you're observing, uh, your toxic masculinity and you're, you're, you're observing, um, these shadow parts of yourself and you're watching them whirl around and you're like, um, you know, I, I look back at parts of my life. Sometimes when I'm in meditation, I get these flashbacks of things that I've done or said to people. And I'm like, Oh, that does not feel good. That was an asshole thing to do. And I think that the music helps me sit with it in a way that if I was just sitting in my room thinking about that, it would probably lead to spiraling or like depression or like judgment of myself. But in the music or even the plant medicine, you know, both of those, I think I can observe them and I'm like, I don't like that about myself. What can I do now in the future moving forward to make better decisions or to do the work or what tools do I need to start utilizing to get to a new spot? So I think like, you know, people have this perception of me saying like, uh, I just see you sitting in a room meditating all day. And I'm like, absolutely not. You know, <laughs> I'm like, and I'm like, I make this and I'm a part of this because I probably need it more than anyone. You know what I mean? And it's something that has helped me face my shit. And I'm not, I haven't always been a good person. I haven't always done and said the right things. And I've um, heard a lot of people. And um, I think it helps me to observe that just as much as like saying, Hey, you did something really cool. You built listening to smile from the ground up and you were homeless. And it's like, yeah, that's great. But the real process for me and doing that was being able to look at all these shadow parts and these bad things that I feel like I've done to myself and to other people and say, 
I want to do better. And, and I think, um, Kobe Bryant said something like, you know, it's not about the competition. It's about being better than you were as an individual yesterday. Right. So it's like each day evolving into a, a more evolved, higher purpose of yourself. And I think that for me, this music gives you that ability to face the stuff in a way that you're not spiraling and you can, um, not feel personally connected to it, but observe it and say, um, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm choosing to do better now and to, and to move forward and to get to that place where, uh, those tools help in that evolution, I guess, you know? Yeah. That yeah. sounds phenomenal. I mean, right <laughs> as you're right as you were talking about it, I'm like, yeah, that's very much like plant medicine. It's like the third person point of view and then it doesn't hurt as bad, but you still get to see it from all angles. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then you brought yeah. it up and I was like, Oh God. Um, <laughs> What do you, would you recommend for people that first sign online to a subscription? Where do they start? Is it something where it's just, um, I'm going to feel into this and see where I'm drawn? Or, or is there a path that you take people through in terms of how they would go about approaching this and really working with it? And then, you know, you kind of answered it with a six month listening to the same song. But yeah. do you stick with a song until you're done with it? Or do you keep moving through? How, how do you recommend people work with your music? Yeah, so... Um on our Bandcamp page, there's a, a wellness series that's for the public and it's for personal use. So basically, um, someone that wants to work with this music at home can buy a CD. They're 25 bucks. They can buy an album and then start, you know, working with it. And it's really um, just laid out for them. Like it'll be for pain relief, for um, uh like we have a, um, there's a shamanic drumming album, you know, so it's basically the way it's set up is it's very easy to see the title of the album and to know the focus of where they're going with that. So that's the first step where I say, here, check this out, see if this resonates with you. The second step would be working, like we have personal frequency coaching where we get into explaining more about sound healing. People get to ask questions. It's an hour long Zoom call. Um, it's a template that gives them a two week outline to how, how to use the music. Um, gives them breath works and tension setting deep listening skills it, it shows them kind of a foundation template of like how to use this and implement it on a daily and then it, it also has where we customize tracks for them so whatever target focus they're going for we create tracks for them either um through the catalog that already exists, but handpicking those for them, or they can choose the route of having customized tracks that are specifically for them with the style of music and things that they're wanting. Um, and then the third step is basically like the practitioners who are utilizing on a commercial level that are wanting to have their proper rights and permissions, but also be able to create new revenue streams with the music. So they can use it in social media. They can use it for videos. They can put it in a podcast. They can um, resell it to the clients. They can use it one-on-one -on -one sessions. And it basically just gives them the year long. And the difference with the practitioners is, is that every month we make a new album that's in line with the astrology. So we look at the astrology that's coming in and then we create an album for the collective and those are exclusive to that membership program. So people sign up for that. And there, we've had a lot of people who are like, I don't want to do practitioner stuff, but I just want to be a part of that subscription. So they, they can do that as well. And they get basically two free albums when they sign up and then they get an album every month. And those albums come as downloads, but then they get all the astrology information for the month like laid out. And then they also get all the frequency and the intention of the song. So a lot of people like having all that information and they just kind of look forward to going deeper each month with that. And then if you're an affiliate or a member, you get to also email and have support. So if you ask questions about the music or wanted to learn more, um, you can do that through email. And then also they get to vote. Like we'll send out a thing saying, you know, what's some music you'd like to hear next month genre wise. And so a lot of people like that they can kind of have a say in like what's coming down the pike. And so that's pretty neat. And then the last engagement would be the workplace wellness. Um, so we're working with like Cliff Bar now and we're growing into some of these other uh, areas of opportunity with companies, um, basically restructuring, uh, like company culture, creating more joy, more productivity and focus in the workplace, and then utilizing that through hosting events in the workplace, like during the day, and then incentivizing that, like saying, Hey, if we're going to have three events this month, if you attend all three events, you know, on Friday, we're going to let everyone get off two hours early, you know, and stuff like that. So it's just, it's a way to try to get 
mainstream America into meditation and mindfulness. And um, they're utilizing the music where, you know, at these events in the, in the workplace, but also at their workstations and their computers, and then being able to utilize it at home as well. So it's cool. That's massive. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, what, what would you say is the best way to consume this? You know, is it in a quiet, dark space, headphones? Um, talk a little bit about, I mean, when you're downloading this, is it coming in WAV file or MP3? You know, it's, it's, yeah, it's come, they can choose WAV file, um, but it comes in the, the high 320 MP3 okay. you know, and they can choose a WAV file if they want. It just depends on what, you know, people choose. WAV files are definitely a higher quality and they're, you know, for me, I really like the higher quality stuff. Um, but 320 MP3 is not that bad. I mean, it's, it's still nice but it doesn't take as much bandwidth as the wave file does um so yeah they can choose that and then um as far as the space utilizing it i think it's going to be different with each person and what their focus is like there's a lot of people who are wanting to put this on at work and have something in the background that keeps them focused and you know and we have like movement meditation volume one volume two and there's like things that people utilize with that but um I think it's always surprising. Like I have friends that are like, dude, I love metal music and I, I meditate to it all the time. And I'm like, cool. You know, it's like everyone's so different. You know, I remember when I was in a metal band, when I was younger, I went to sleep listening to like Helmet, you know, like they just put it on, the, it was a cassette tape, hit play and just like flip it over. And like, you know, I was just like sleeping. But yeah, it's just, it's crazy. So I think people are just so different that there's not really a one size fits all. But if I were, were going to say someone's like wanting to get into meditation and really um, dive into the possibilities of what this is, I would definitely say setting aside 10 to 15 minutes each day in the morning, as soon as they get up before they pick up their phone and, you know, any of that, they just, um, have a little time that they're devoting to themselves away from people and just giving themselves that quiet time with the music and give it a week, you know, 10, 15 minutes a day for a week. And most people are saying like, Oh, I can tell a difference, you know, for sure. And at two weeks, you know, people are really having shifts and their mood as well as like the habits. Cause I think like, um, what you're doing in a sense by creating this time is you're creating new neuro networks, especially if you're pairing intention and breath work with the meditation. Um, you know, and people are saying, well, what intention? And I'm like, well, what intention are you wanting? Are you creating a new business? Are you manifesting? You know, you need money. You need, what is the resources that you're needing to bring in? Or is it a new job opportunity? You know, and so I, I, I constantly talk about in the Louise Hayes book, uh, You Can Heal Your Life, there's a section where she talks about, I had this job. I don't, I don't like this job anymore. It's, it's, you know, served its time. And so instead of being like, I hate my job, she wanted you to say like, I have gratitude for this job and it helped me in a time of need, but now it's time for me to release this job to the next person who needs it just as much as I did. And I'm ready for my new position to open where I'm supposed to be going and not putting a hard, I want this job over here and to have this position, but to be open so that the universe can do its magic. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so when you put intention with sound, I think it's just, you know, it's the, it's the, the elixir that really creates change in stagnant energy. And so I think that's what I try to get people to do is give yourself a little alone time, 10, 15 minutes a day, put some real intention behind this, this session that you're doing with the music and do some breath work, even if it's just basic, you know, breathe in, breathe out, and you're consciously breathing it. You know, it doesn't have to be fire breath or put in some kind of crazy, it just, breath will slow, you're bringing in more oxygen, which is in turn creating more circulation. You're giving more of the organs their vitals that they need. And so by just doing 10 breaths in, 10 breaths out, you know, before you start this process, you're already lowering your heart rate. You're slowing down your brainwave activity. You're getting focused for this intention that you're doing. That's massive, brother. Yeah, I'm <laughs> yeah. excited. I'm excited to deep dive it. I was. Yeah. It made me think of Joe Dispenza when you were talking about Louise Hay, and obviously she's she was Dispenza before Dispenza. Yeah. But one of the ways that that uh, really stuck out to me in working with manifestation is that you have your intention, and it also has to pair with surrender. Yeah. So you hold the intention, but it's not too specific. Then you surrender the how and when that that shows up. Right. Yes. So you let go of some of the specifics. You allow the universe to work its magic. God, whatever you want to call that, high self. And, um, and that's where it lies. That's the unattached approach to still working your way through something and having desires and goals to attain. Yeah. You know? 
Yeah. But I love it. He plays music at his events, so it's like, of course, like we should be for damn sure playing music. <laughs> I want to recreate that event in my living room or in my bedroom, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's crazy because I just uh, moved to a new part of California and uh, in Oakland, just outside, like Piedmont, Oakland. And I was there, and um, I'm, I'm, uh, I have a roommate that's a filmmaker who's made Hoop Dreams. You're familiar mm-hmm. with Hoop yeah. Dreams? Yeah. So Frederick is my roommate and moved there. And th- our meeting was just so synergistic. And he's like, how long are you going to be in Oakland? I said, I don't know, three months, maybe six months. And he's like, where are you going? I said, I have no idea. I just know that it, this is not where I'm going to be full time. And so, yeah, so I'm moving to Texas and it's the same, it's the same thing. It's, uh, I just feel so called here by spirit. There's so many things that have aligned and, uh, it's just been so powerful. And so it's just like, I don't know how anything is happening, but I just trust spirit and it's just every day more and more things are are unfolding. And I think like encouraging people to do that is hard because I think as a bohemian artist, you know, growing up, you learn to do that and to kind of flow in that flow state and trust and move in that way. But I think common, uh, the muggles, right? We'll say, we'll say, right? Yeah. yeah. I think it's harder for them because they're saying, well, if I do this, then this is gone. And then what do I do if this happens? And I think, and you're like, in a sense saying, let it go, man, let it go. Like you're trying to control. And I think I find myself in those moments and I have to remind myself, like you're trying to control and you're limiting what spirit can do for you. And it's like, I think the hardest and most uh, also beneficial lesson that we'll learn in this life is like stop trying to control spirit you know <laughs> yeah. yeah well i mean you see you see it show up in film and movie and, and all these different things like uh uh the jump the leap of faith mm-hmm. you know you toss the dust out harrison ford and he's got to make yeah. the jump right like that's it that's the not being able to see past what your lights can see at night yeah in the car while you're driving yeah you know? we're, we're at a critical point in in human history where like we were <laughs> there's a giant gap we don't know if we're going to make it across but it's going to require that faith and that trust yeah yeah was was that the third one where he was walking across the the invisible beam yeah 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 yeah. Yeah, that's cool (laughs) there's the visual for it well this is phenomenal brother it's been excellent having you i definitely want to have you back on i'm going to deep dive all this stuff okay um what is, where's the best place people can reach out to you and, and where can they dive into this? Yeah, so my email is ian at listening to smile.com. The website is listening to smile.com. It has a lot more information about what we're doing and all the um, uh, programs and things that we offer. And so those are two really great places. And then the band camp where they can get the music uh, is uh, listening to smile, the number one dot bandcamp.com. And they can go there and look at some of the albums that are available for public and those are for personal use. And uh, um, so those are the three uh, best spots. And then we also have a YouTube channel, uh, Listening to Smile, that on YouTube. And it has a lot of testimonials from people, from veterans. And um, there was a woman on there that had a dental procedure done. And she had no sedative and did our music and had a cavity filled. And I was like, wow. wow. <laughs> so, yeah, it was just really neat stuff. Um, yeah, from everything from autoimmune things to veterans with PTSD that have given us some really great testimonials that are on there. That's phenomenal, brother. Thank you so much for coming on, Ian. Thanks, man. Thank Thank you for having me. Yeah.